lo, when God's prophet announces judgment against both clergy and people, how shall we respond? This is Pastor Ken Larson, a visitation pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. I don't know where you are, but I'm glad you are here with us for this Bible study. We invite you to worship with us. Foundation service, which is traditional at 8.30 on Sunday, or the Connections service, which is contemporary, at 10.30 on Sundays. Or you can watch anytime online, as they say, on demand, at trinitydelray.org slash live. And I invite you to tune in on Sundays at 9.30 for this Bible study. All you have to do is look for Pastor Larson's Bible study, and you'll find several of them there, today's and the past ones. Thank you for joining us wherever and whenever you are. We're studying Malachi, and we're going to find out that though this book was written centuries ago, how many centuries? 24. We're going to find out that Malachi has something to say about the faith and attitudes, attitudes of today's pastors and churchgoers. I didn't say members churchgoers of all kinds. So we're doing a couple of weeks of introduction here. Ask for your patience while we get the overview. We put this book in historical and theological contexts. What's going on and when is it? And who are the main actors in the drama that God is directing? His prophet Malachi speaks a word of judgment. Judgment is coming. I think that's something that all of us have to be aware of every day, that the Lord has a right to come and judge the people. Don't ever forget it, that the Lord is God and not we ourselves. His is the kingdom. So judgment is coming against anyone who lies in God's name, whether that be a pastor or priest, a teacher, or anyone who claims to be associated with God and his work in the church, to lie and say that God said something when he has not said it, invites judgment from that same God, the Lord. After Malachi speaks his word of judgment, and then... Oh, the blank slide is intentional. <laughs> you know how in a, in a document that you receive in the mail from, oh, let's say your insurance company, you'll get to page 13 and it'll be blank. And then there's this silly statement on that page that says, this page has intentionally been left blank. Well, why in the world did you print it? I just don't understand that. I guess there's room for expansion of the article that was being discussed, and they want to go on in the next page with a new subject. I don't know how they do that or why they do that. But this page I put before you, I left blank to indicate that after Malachi and then nothing, nothing. For over 600 years, from Samuel to Malachi, the Lord had sent his prophets to speak his word of judgment and mercy, law and gospel. The, the word of judgment is law. There's not a word of gospel in judgment. But soon comes God's tender, loving mercy. So some of the prophets that spoke in his name are listed and they spoke for over 600 years. Did you realize that from Samuel to Malachi? All right. But the priest and the people would not listen. They are like children. We are all like children. And 
<laughs> I won't sing the song. The priests and the people like, like children because children will say, I'm sorry, mommy, I won't do it again. If you have children, you understand because tomorrow or next week, they did it again. Mm -hmm. Didn't they? Did you stop loving them? No. They're your children. All right. You are not to hate your children. You might dislike what they do, but you still long to welcome them back into your arms. The older they get, it is harder to do because they resist your love and they know they are wrong. And the same is true of God's children. The longer they live, the more they take advantage of the mercy of God and will not repent. They won't listen. To listen in the Old Testament really meant to listen and obey. I heard you, God. Well, then now do it. You understand how it goes. And this has not changed in the last 2,400 years. So we're looking at this introduction as the Lord speaks through Malachi, words of judgment and warning in which the prophet in God's name is offering forgiveness and mercy. It's not all law. And he says, repent and turn to God in faith. The Lord loves you and would eagerly welcome you back. That's the message of every prophet. That's the message of every pastor today. You understand how many millions have strayed from the flocks in which they once were enrolled, where they once worshipped? The statistics this morning I heard on television is that 20 years ago, 70% of uh, people uh, had some type of a religious, uh, belonged to a religious organization. Today, it's just dropping less than 50%. In 20 years? In 20 years. Wow. We have, we have a nation that in large part has left the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think I, of this sentence often, not speaking politically, but religiously, we have reaped what we have sown. I'm not going to develop that statement, but I think you know what I'm saying. Uh, God said through the prophet, would someone read that please, Judy? I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts, Isaiah 6, 5, verse 2. Yeah. Hmm. You understand, spread out my hands. Can I do it that way? It's a, it's, a, it's a symbol of welcoming back, if you would come. When a child is estranged from a parent, read uh, John, excuse me, Luke 15. And the father had his arms open to the rebellious child who is called what? The one who comes back? Oh, um, the prodigal son? Right. That's, that's how God is. That's what it means to spread out my hands all day long. Why would you leave me? Everything you need is here. Well, Malachi cares for these people. But what then? 
When Malachi is finished, what further what word does God have to say? When Isaiah says all day long, he means during all the period of my history with my people, I have been like a hen who would gather her chicks under her wing, but you would not. That's what Jesus said a few days before he went to the cross. And then, <clears throat> what's that? What's that word? Silence. Silence. Oh. Even the word silence is silent. You'd have to ask God why. If you ask me, I'd say, well, there was nothing more to say. And God didn't say anything. You know, unless someone digs up a book someday that we didn't know about, but you no, know, we have some books, but they are not part of the inspired scriptures. The reason we know that is because there are some uh, terrible false doctrines in there that are contrary to the gospel. We could discuss that someday. I know that some of you are familiar with the apocryphal books, but um, I'm not prepared to teach them right now. The Missouri Synod, the Concordia Publishing House, has published a reader's edition to the apocryphal books and put them in their historical context. So I'm going to briefly outline that historical period without going into a study of those books. Okay, they are accepted by the Roman Catholic Church as part of the books of the Old Testament. Almost all, as far as I know, of the Protestant churches do not accept them. So that difference will remain, I suppose, until Jesus comes. But after Malachi, what happens? As I said, there is no word from God. There is silence. There is nothing. No, there is not quite nothing. But let's develop that idea. What is it like to have no word from God? Put yourself in the place of the people living in the 4th century BC, that is the 300s, 300 and up to 400 years before Jesus is born. What's it like to be God's people and have no prophets? Might feel like you've been deserted. Uh huh. What's that like? How does that feel? It's like going to the movies, and that's been true in large part during the past year. There's nothing on the screen. In fact, you can't even get in the doors. And you turn on the television, it's blank. No sound either. And you turn on the radio, maybe you get static. You turn to all of the stations, nothing. So you turn on the internet, and as has probably happened in your experience, right? Cannot connect. You investigate your wiring or something, but nothing you do can bring up the internet. I think there would be <laughs> some panic in America yes. if no one, <laughs> huh? Can you imagine that? I mean, if you're down a day, it, it can cause you to get quite upset. No email. You can't order online. You can't look up uh, the book of Malachi. Oh, I guess I do have a Bible somewhere, but since I've been on the internet, I don't know 
where my Bible is. I'm being a little bit silly there. But if you can't connect with people in the way that you've been connecting with people because you had no other, no other way to connect with people. Uh, and, and you go to, go ahead, Judy. I was going to say it's a very fearful, fearful feeling because you don't know what's going on. Is good going on? Is bad going on in the world? What's happening? Exactly. You've been cut off. So you ask your neighbor and your neighbor says, I don't know. I can't connect either. Fearful is a good, I think that's the feeling we would have. You can't connect. You know what would happen? We would form at least. Deserted. You like feel deserted. Said. Yeah. Okay. We went nine days without power, without connection during Hurricane Wilma. Yes. No phone, no TV, no nothing. We couldn't even go out onto the road because the traffic lights weren't working. And so, how did you feel? Uh, a little panic because I couldn't get to my relatives to tell them I was okay. And I, you know. Oh, just like this. Yeah. <laughs> no connections. Mm -hmm. I think I, I'm just jumping ahead to say, I wonder what we would do. I think we would f form, if possible, with any neighbors we could, small communities where I guess we would remember. I've still got my Bible. Do they want a Bible study? We could do that. You want to come over to our front room? We'll have worship. You see, people need people. And if there's no word from the Lord, Malachi is gone and they can't connect to God. And it was it was be it would be like going to church and the doors are closed and there's a sign up that says all services have been canceled. Well, that's about what it was uh, at the end of March last year. Yeah. April Fool was not very funny. All canceled. And before we figured out how to get online, and it took churches a, a few weeks to do that, it, it took, um, we didn't start the Zoom until the end of May. Yeah. Through, through the encouragement of Aaron Ash and Bobby Klim. So, we began to connect again. And I'm so grateful that you guys and others were willing to do that. You know, I, I think that we filled a, a little hole here. So we don't like being disconnected from God or from each other. You think about the reasons for worship. The primary one is to get God a chance to talk to us, to give us something that we can't get anywhere else. Publix is closed on Easter. <laughs> I was going to say, I think when you said we would form small groups, we'd probably get out in the street and meet our neighbors sometimes right. for the first time. And, uh, and, you know, we look at lawlessness, if there's all of a sudden no law and order, we would look after protecting ourselves, which is happening in some cities right now where neighborhoods are looking after one another and uh, start caring about one another. And like you said, sharing food um, and of course, sharing the word of God. But uh, sometimes in our mission work, we look at some of those physical uh, needs first, and then we can uh, carry on with our um, message of the saving grace with love. I think you're exactly right. All right. So I'm trying to paint the picture of how God's people may have felt and how they reacted when there was no voice of the prophet. Perhaps I'm overdrawing it, but for good purpose. Well, we can, uh, the other thing about that I was thinking too, is we can also go off on our own and start forming our own, just like they back in Moses's day where the people of Israel started forming their own idols and gods and suddenly oh. 
going in that direction also to have something to worship if we aren't getting the truth. Uh -huh. Yes, we all worship something or someone. We have a tendency to want to grab onto something. That's a good point, Judy. And it happened in mm -hmm. history. And it will happen again. Mm -hmm. The sociologists study people and they say, we all worship someone or something or several things. Someone whose approval you seek will not speak to you at all. Maybe you've had that experience. I hope not, but maybe you have. No matter what you do, no matter how you ask, you only get one response. Silence. It's a terrible thing to do, and I don't recommend that we give that as an answer to an argument. Because silence often sounds like refusal to forgive. Not necessarily, but how can I find out if you still love me if you won't speak to me? Husbands and wives, parents and children, and even if you allow this to go to employers and employees, silence does not evoke love and loyalty, but sometimes the opposite, distrust. So when God is silent, you know, it wasn't like everyone went into the Bible bookstore and bought themselves a copy of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These were expensive scrolls, and they were found in the house of the Lord. But there is no house of the Lord to go to. So what's that like? How do you feel? Lost. Lost. Mm -hmm. Unsure. Yeah. Or you can begin to feel, I guess, more hungry for what you didn't have or lost. Um, mm. You become hungry if you, know, if you had the word and you suddenly lost it and didn't hear from God, which I'm thinking many people who God doesn't ever walk away from us, but we walk away from them, him. Um, That's true. You would, you know, you feel lonely. Lost, lonely, maybe afraid. So you want to repair it, don't you? Yeah, you want to repair it. And all of a sudden there isn't something there to go back and grasp onto. Yeah. The glue doesn't stick anymore. How can you approach the one who gives you the silent treatment? Insofar as you believe or know that it's your fault. What do you say? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. The two hardest words in the English language to say. And, <laughs> yeah. and sometimes that person doesn't really want to even see you or talk with you. So letters have become real important. Um, unless they tear it before they tear it up before they open it when they see who it's from. But many times a letter can um, say a lot and you can, some people are very, are much better at expressing their feelings in a letter than they are personally. You know what they do with young children? They ask them to draw a picture of their family. I don't understand the psychology of it. I'm not an expert in that area, but I understand that if a child draws a picture of mommy and daddy and themselves and perhaps their siblings, the distance between the people on the piece of paper on the, in the drawing 
and the expressions that they may be old enough to put on their face. I'm talking about young children, five, six, maybe seven. Marriage so counselors, marriage counselors many times use written letters um, when spouses are silent towards one another. Yeah, if you can get them to that point, <laughs> to that point. So it's hard to approach someone who gives you the silent treatment. I don't know. I can't read in and and say that I know what the people said, except when I read, and you will read, if you haven't already, the dialogues that occur between God and the people, between God and the priests. You may get an insight into what the people were thinking. There are the 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. The voice of the prophets goes quiet, and there's no word from the Lord until John the Baptist. And he is the last prophet in the Old Testament, and at the same time, the first prophet in the New Testament. Now, there's no word from the Lord, and I have to say, of course, that there's a huge exception to that that when Gabriel speaks to Mary and to Joseph and to Zechariah all right you know that but there's no prophet if you want to say Gabriel was a prophet I'll say well in a way he was prophetic but he was an angel not a prophet Okay, or if you want to say a prophet is anyone who speaks for the Lord, I'll have to grant you that, a, all right, Gabriel was a prophet. He's not named among the prophets. So we have a collection of passages in which John the Baptist speaks. Well, he says a lot more than this, but what I am going to show you is that these are the passages that connect Malachi to John the Baptist. Maybe you've seen this before. And Judy has already read, Evelyn, I would like you to start reading in Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Yes. I'm going to send my messenger. He's not here yet, but he's going to prepare. Important word, you're looking ahead, aren't you? And the one you seek, well, he's here. He's coming. All right. Now, Chris, would you read Malachi 4, mm. 5, and 6? Yes. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Wow. I will send Elijah. You should object to this because you know that Elijah had already come and gone. Hmm. Remember, he's the one who went to heaven directly without going through the grave. He's the one of the two that did that. Malachi is announcing that Elijah will come again. And you can understand the consternation and confusion among some people, including Herod, when that happened. And then finally, the fulfillment, the fulfillment in Luke uh, chapter one. Uh, Corolla, can you see this on the screen? Yes, sir. Would you read that, please? Of course. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Oh, that's an interesting thing in the New Testament. Who is speaking? You can guess, remember? My rule, guesses are good. 
make ready. How to make ready for the Lord a uh, people prepared. Uh, um, Who said this? John the Baptist came before the Lord. Yes, he did, but he's not the one speaking these words. He hasn't been born yet, so he can't do that. Must be Gabriel. It is Gabriel. Oh, Next no. question. <laughs> to whom is, it, is Gabriel speaking? Well, to Elizabeth? Close. Oh, okay. It's a very close. <laughs> oh, very Not nice. Mary, huh? But Elizabeth. Not Elizabeth, but Mary. No. No, not Mary. Okay. This he will go before him in a spirit. So who's speaking? It's a it's Gabriel, and he is speaking to. I'm sorry, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> He's speaking to Zechariah, who is mute. Oh, oh, Elizabeth's husband. That's right. That's why how you were very close. And about whom? I think you got to guess this one. Okay. Yes? About, oh, about, about, the, about their son, John the Baptist? That's right. Okay, now I know that's a, that's an Advent text. We would have, might have read this uh, if we were studying the Advent text back in in December, but you know you don't read every book in the Bible every day, and it goes away. The memory fades. Oh, how I'm what a plague upon the aged that we should lose our memories. All right, that's enough of that. Matthew chapter 11. Back to Judy, please. For all the prophets and the law prophesied under John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. There is the connection. Jesus makes the connection. John. Now, John isn't Elijah. But he is the Elijah. Of the New Testament. Of the New Testament. He is the Elijah that Malachi prophesied about. And there's where you get the connection between the old and the new. It's a fantastic study. You just keep on discovering these things. And if you have a Bible that has little A's and B's and C's or little footnotes, and you look those up, you can discover those uh, threads that connect it's all one author, it's all one message, and uh, the Christ prophesied in the Old Testament is the Christ who has come. And his people are, his people need to be listening. Um, is that why in the New Testament you hear, uh, uh, I think it's in there somewhere, that the people say, is this Elijah? Yes. Uh. But that was for Jesus, though, not John the Baptist, or was it for both? I don't it, know. It was principally for John the Baptist. I can't think of a time where they thought, well, yes, they did think one time that, um, well, they thought one time when uh, John the Baptist was beheaded, yeah. and when uh, Jesus came, they they thought, well, is this, who do you think that I am? And some said it was Elijah. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Ah, we'd make the connection. Yeah. But Jesus wasn't Elijah who was to come. That was John the Baptist. Uh -huh. Okay. See how, how he puts it. And if you are willing to accept it, he that's another way of saying, uh, if, if you will, you know, people will make a comparison that's not entirely accurate, but somewhat accurate. And they'll say, oh, oh if you will, and you understand, it means if you're willing to accept my comparison. You got it, don't you? Okay. And there was, so a, pardon? There was a lot of time uh, in between that. When you say that silence, uh, we're speaking like, what, 400 some years or something? That's right. Now, to be sure, those books didn't uh, disappear 
the books that had been recorded in the histories of the kings and the chronicles of the kings. Those records were there. It is not easy for us to figure out. Hmm. I'd have to ask somebody else. To is what that extent. the books that um, the Catholic Church would? Oh, I'm sorry. What did, I can't remember what you said. You called the them. apocryphal. Apocryphal. Do they fill in that gap be, or try to fill in that gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament or yes. not? Yes, to some extent. I'm going to get to that now. Okay. During those years of silence, okay, they do not indicate nothing is happening. There's no period of history when there's no history. <laughs> there's no vacuum. Life goes on. In God's story, I like to say his story. Uh, that's not accurate. The word history doesn't come from his story. All right. But it is his story. And God's story is worked out in the lives of everyone. You don't see it. I think we tend to see something that's very inaccurate. There's secular and there is sacred. No, all life is sacred. Okay, but isn't there secular history? No, it's God's story of sin going on in the world at, at times almost unchecked. And if I keep uttering the uh, simplistic notion, well, God's in control. And you say to me, and I'll have to agree with you, well, it sure doesn't seem like it. I know the word, the operative word is seem. It doesn't seem like it, but you cannot see history from God's vantage point. Could you have seen it from God's vantage point when the sky went black and his son was hanging on the cross? Uh -uh. I thought of the verse from Luke 24 about uh, this week that connects with what I just said about the, the history is going on and God knows it all and he knows what's happening. You know the two Emmaus disciples? They're going to Emmaus and one of them is named Cleopas, and the other is not named. And we not we know that it's not one of the 11 because they come back to the 11, so it couldn't be one of the 11. It's not John or James. It's Cleopas and his friend, and they're joined by Jesus. But before they have, uh, he reveals himself to them, I'm trying to give you the short version for time's sake. They say, one of them says, but we thought, but we thought he was the one to redeem Israel. And the implication is really strong, but apparently not. They crucified him. He's dead. They, they put him in the tomb and put that rock in front of it. Well, that's it. It's over. And they are Sorrowful. Wow, that doesn't begin to describe how the Cle Cleopas and friend are feeling. They're walking home. It's over. And here's my, my return to what they said. But we thought. Do you understand? When you think you know what's going on, I can just about guarantee you, you don't know what's going on. Not from God's point of view. See, there's more depth to studying the history of God's people than you think, because it reveals to us that we don't know what God is doing in the background. Am I making too strong of a point on this? I don't think so. Life goes on. Do you have any comments about that?
Okay. At this point in God's history, he is preserving his remnant. Why? <laughs> Why is God going to preserve a remnant of people who have not forgotten him and still have faith in him? Because he loves them. That's right. He does. Why else? He loves them. They're the lineage to Christ. That's exactly what I was leading toward. Ooh. You see, what is the pro prophecy that out of Judah will come the Messiah? Mm -hmm. And of all the tribes, Judah is the one preserved here. That's not, I'm not saying that really accurately. I don't know why you're at the bottom of my screen now. God is preserving his remnant so that out of that remnant, and you read the lineage in Luke, I think it's chapter four, and in Matthew chapter one, with all the begats. <laughs> and there is the chain, in Luke's case, from Adam to Jesus. And you can read it, and those are the... Out of that remnant, some of those came through those 400 years. And the priest and the people still have his word. And I said before, I don't know to what extent that word is available. I need someone to study those 400 years a little bit more accurately than I have and give the word about the word during that time. So here is where you get this um, something that you can read. You can read First and Second Maccabees. And if you don't have a Bible with the apocryphal books in them, you can go on the internet, <laughs> you can go on the internet, or you can go to the library, or you can go buy a, um, the, the apocryphal books and read First and Second Maccabees. And those two books are the most, pardon me, uh, historical books that reveal some of what happens in those 400 years. And you can read Josephus. I was going to say Josephus was a historian. Pardon? I was just going to say Joesa, jo, Joesa. I remember pa, uh, Paul Meyer talking about him being the historian yes. and that was primarily history from his point of view. Paul Meyer retranslated the history that Josephus wrote and put in historical comments and applications so that it's easier to read his version than to get the one off the internet, <laughs> which is free. All right. Um, Pastor, way back a number of years ago, I did read I couldn't tell you what I read, actually, uh, the Maccabees, because I, and I, I actually got it from a, a, a thrift store where it was a, a study Bible for Catholics, for children. And it was so, it, it is really interesting. But what I found out, and then a Messianic Jewish person um, verified, you know, sort of, which I didn't understand. That is how the whole thing of Hanukkah got in. Uh -huh. And so I couldn't understand if that was so important. Why wasn't it, uh, you know, um, in the Bible? But, you know, I don't know any of that stuff. I, I just, but I, that was where Hanukkah came from. I mean, the, the celebration of Hanukkah for the saving of the temple by the Maccabees. Correct. Now, Hanukkah is not one of the required festivals of the Old Testament. It no. was it was the it was the religious community of the time that decided we should commemorate this forever. Happy Hanukkah! Yeah, okay. and uh, that was a wonderful thing that they were preserved with God's hand in back of it all. 
I can't make the application to the Old or New Testament, except in that general way. There are other things in there that you will find interesting. And if you read it, you will have another dozen questions for me that I can't answer without joining you in that study. It's all we have to pick and choose. Life is short. <laughs> I, I hate to put it so starkly, but uh, I want to I want to spend my time. The, the time that God gives us is so short. And time is precious. If I'm guilty of one great sin in my life, it's the wasting of time. And I'm not going to... I'm not going to talk about that. It's uh, uh, God has forgiven me and I try to repent of it. My wife is busy all the time. She has an industry about her. And uh, I admire her. Enough of that. We're just talking about the years of silence. And before those years of silence happen, the Lord commissions Malachi to speak to priests and people. Well, let's see, uh, five and 15 are 20, so that we're probably at about 45 minutes. I failed to start my timer today. I think I'm gonna start asking one of you to time it. <laughs> we're about 16 after when we started today, Pastor. What was 16? Yeah, about 16 after 10 when we started. 16 and 45. 51. That's about right. So the Lord commissions Malachi. Now, what I've done is talk about the silent years, and now I'm going to go back to 430 BC, before the silence, okay? Don't want to confuse you, but I needed to talk about those years of silence before which Malachi speaks to the priests and the people. Now, we're only halfway through the second lesson on introduction because there is a lot to say about it. I didn't have to say all those words. I could have flipped through all the slides in 40 minutes. Well, what's the point of that? We're introducing a book so that when we read it, we'll understand what's going on. You understand? Mm -hmm. All right. Meanwhile, in Judah, specifically in Jerusalem. It's about 450 years before Christ is born, and the remnant returns. One record says it's 43,000, another one, if you add everybody up, it's round figures, 50,000 people come back from Babylonia to Jerusalem and the neighborhoods round about. Can you imagine what that was like? Psalm 126, we were like people who dreamed. They knew it would be 70 years. They knew that in the period of 70 years, most of those who left did not come back. You understand a lifetime, 70 years? Right. If you read Jeremiah, there's a wonderful passage in there where God speaks through Mary, Jeremiah and says, what I want you to do is to build houses and plant fields and marry your daughters to the sons and marry your sons to the daughters of your own people. I said, of your own people. Mm -hmm. And pray for the city in which you live. They're living in, in a foreign place with foreign deities and foreign practices. It's just very uncomfortable. Now, Jeannie and I lived in Italy for two and a half years. It was wonderful. But the first few weeks, it was just, everything is different. The money is different. The water is different. You can't drink it. <laughs> 
and every and the food and the practices and the religion oh my the religion and everything is different we were we were living as foreigners <laughs> we were sojourners first peter chapter 1 and we didn't return until our period of service in Italy was over, Air Force. So we returned and it was wonderful. Uh, when we landed at JFK, I didn't literally kiss the ground, but you know, I'm not going to go on. It's just uh, what a what a what a memory it was. So what do they do with the help of uh, the gifts that came uh, from Cyrus and Darius? They rebuilt the temple. There is a somebody uh, drew and somebody uh, constructed a model of what the second temple looked like or may have looked like. And it was smaller than Solomon's temple. It wasn't as ornate. It wasn't done exactly according to the plan that God gave to David to give to Solomon, architect and builder. So Malachi is the one speaking to these people who are in Judah. And then we have another historical reference. This is really important that we cover this today because of a kind of an assignment that I'm going to be giving. In Judah and Jerusalem, we have just before and during the time of Malachi, Ezra the priest and Nehemiah the prophet are promoting and enforcing some reforms because the people don't, the people do not have everything right. And we're going to discuss the why of that, if you will, if uh, I think we'll have to do it next week. So what I want you to do is to consider reading Ezra and Nehemiah while we study Malachi. It will take you a while, but Ezra and Nehemiah. At this point, I'm going to apologize, but I don't know. It's not my fault that I could not find a way to send you the slides last week. I tried several times. I sent a test to the same people, and you got the test. But when I tried to send the slides, it refused. And I think there was some key word in there that my account flagged it as uh, spam or something. So you didn't get it. I'm going to try again. But please uh, look in and you'll find it interesting reading. Don't worry if you don't understand it all. Pastor, yeah. Yes. Did, had you not asked us to re read Nabom and Haggy? Or was I wrong on that? I don't remember Nahum. I, oh. I may have mentioned it, but also Haggai is yes. a book in which some of the same problems were condemned. Okay. Especially neglecting the house of the Lord. Yes. Okay. Yes. Ezra and Nehemiah are most important here. Yes. So the walls around Jerusalem get rebuilt under the direction of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a is a working prophet. <laughs> And then Malachi comes on the scene at about 430. The, the numbers cannot be exact, but these are based on comparisons with other secular history of the time. Okay. Now, here's a, a timeline that I gave you last week. And you didn't get it in the mail because it wouldn't go. But the 
the 586 is the accepted year pretty much for the fall of Judah when the temple and all of the buildings and the walls are crushed and conquered by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar. So it, okay. Um, then about 50 years later, they begin to reconstruct it. And there is the temple completed in about 515 BC. Mm. And here you have, as I said, Ezra, Nehemiah at the same period and before Malachi begins his prophetic ministry. The walls of Jerusalem get rebuilt about 443. You don't have to memorize that, but here you put Malachi in its historical perspective. If, uh, if I can't get you this email, then you can find this on the internet. That's where I found it. It may not seem like it, but Malachi makes for interesting history. And the, the question I have before you, before we finish today, is why? What is different about the times of the prophet Malachi? A few guesses. What is different? You have any idea? Well, I'm going to give you some answers. Okay. There's no king. I think Corolla is having another conversation. And there's no throne. Remember, the temple is being rebuilt, but there's there's no throne in the king's house. There is no king's house. The Davidic line is ended. I should say it appears to have ended because through the through the remnant it gets extended, but there's no king of Judah. So who's governing? A governor. But the governor reports to Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes the first is king of Persia. Where's Persia? Well, it's Babylon, but there's no Nebuchadnezzar anymore because that kingdom has been defeated. And you know the history of the world. One king takes over the domain of another king and they rule for 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, and they're succeeded by their son and their grandson, and then someone else comes along and knocks them over, and now they, that's the history of the world. It'll go on. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a historian. So these are the differences between Malachi and the other prophets, during which there was somebody on the throne of Judah and Israel. And uh, I don't know if we have time to answer this, to whom does God address himself? No, it's in white. I intended you to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Through Malachi, to whom does God address himself? Who's he talking to? Have you read Malachi chapter one? I, I think it's the priest. Uh, you know, the, the, the priests. I mean, just the small beginning I read. Okay, so you're half right. He addresses himself to the people yes. as well. Because he talks about the son honoring the father and the servants, the master, and etc. That's a comparison. So you ought to also honor the priests, but the priests ought to honor me, and they're not. So the priests returned with the remnant. They were there during the remnant. But God has issues with the priests. And I think this is where we ought to pick it up next. Because uh, there's a lot to do here. 
And I know pues, that we can't finish it in the last few minutes. Otra cosa te digo, imagínate, yo que me fijo tanto en... en uh, Pardon me, Carola, uh, if you're on a conversation, uh, let's... Uh, segundo. Um, segundo. Yes. You're on the phone, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, uh, let uh, mute yourself uh, during that conversation, would you please? And then um, we're going to finish up here right now. Okay. To finish our Bible study. Te tengo que volverte a llamar. Estás en casa. Te, te llamo en, en seguidita. He doesn't get it. Te llamo. I, I, I hate to do that, but I will. Let us think about this as we pray together and um, ask the Lord's help during this time where we look forward to tomorrow morning. Lord God, in this period of darkness, uh, between the darkness of Good Friday and the bright light of Sunday, we address you as believers and ask you to bless our worship, our reception of the great news. He is risen. Until then, Lord, show us through the prophets how much you love us and how often you woo us back with your love to embrace and believe all of your promises and to whom we can now take all of our petitions for mercy and grace, for help, for the removal of these fears that cloud our judgment. Hear us, O oh Lord, according to your many promises. We all ask this and we pray in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.